Worst death traps imaginable. Top three places you can't go and people who win anyways. Part 35. What's good? How your day going? How's your morning? Your evening? Your night? Whenever you're watching this video, we ain't going to talk too much here. We're going to jump right into it because, I mean, hey, we was actually we were actually just talking about this topic on the live stream, which uh, self love will be in the description below. But either way it go, though, I ain't going to talk your ears off. Let's go ahead and jump right into this video, man. You want to check out the original? Link will be in the description below. But let's go. Today, we're gonna look at three places you can't go and people who went there anyways. But in fairness, one of these stories is actually more like a thing you can't do and person who did it anyway. But we believed it was still close enough that it could be included. But before we get into those stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do and we upload once a week. So if that's of interest to you, please eat an orange in front of the like button and make a whole scene about how amazing this fruit tastes and then offer the like button your other orange you have with you. Except don't tell them it's not really an orange, it's the fruit from a strychnine tree. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our our weekly uploads okay let's get into it for copyright stories a thing you're not supposed to do but someone did it anyway oh boy and yes i do know what a strict nine tree is it was two days before christmas in 2010 and 54 year old alan catterall along with his future son-in-law mark were sitting in the break room of a kayak molding facility in the united kingdom where they both worked and as they sat there drinking tea, they began exchanging notes about what gifts they got for the rest of their family for the holidays. And as they spoke, they both were very careful to keep their voices very quiet in fear that someone might overhear them because Alan's wife and daughter also worked at this kayak company. Alan had worked for this company for 10 years, and even though it was backbreaking work a lot of the time, he loved it because it meant he got to spend all this time with his family basically 24-7. It was only 7 a.m., which meant Mark and Alan had just started their shifts, but they were already taking this break to talk about Christmas because they were so excited about it. But they finally said, okay, we do need to go to work, and so they put their cups in the sink, and then Alan made his way down to the factory floor, and his future son-in-law, Mark, made his way up to the control room. On the factory floor, where Alan was heading, was where all the special machinery was inside of these little rooms where the kayaks were actually molded and put together. And it was Alan's job to make sure the machinery was clean and operational. The machinery inside of these little kayak making rooms was very customized and very finicky, and so Alan was one of the few people at the company who really understood what made it work and what would cause issues, and so he was very valuable at the company. That day, Alan knew one of the circuit boards for one of these molding rooms had shorted out, and so the leadership had decided to shut down that particular molding room while the circuit board was fixed. And so when Alan went down and began checking out each of these molding rooms, he knew which one had been shut down. So he knew when he went in there, it was not going to be operational. But when he went into that particular molding room, he noticed that it really needed a good clean. When these kayaks were made inside of these molding rooms, a lot of times the excess plastic would kind of seep out of the actual mold and it would get caked to the walls and it would flake all over the ground. And so periodically, Alan would clean these rooms and he figured right now with this one shut down, he might as well clean it. And so Alan grabbed a crowbar and he headed into this shutdown molding room and he got to work chipping all this plastic off the walls and making a big pile on the ground to sweep out and throw away. But as Alan chipped away at all the plastic, the doors leading into this molding room shut. And so oh, suddenly Alan was cast into total darkness because his only light before that had been coming through these doors. But that was the least of Alan's worries. He knew that if these doors were shutting, these doors were automatic, that meant that the circuit board had to have been fixed and they didn't know he was in here. And so now this molding room must be operational, which meant he only had minutes to get out of this room. And so Alan ran to the door and with his crowbar, he began trying to pry the doors open, but he couldn't. These are mechanically sealed doors. They do not just open. You need to press a button to release them. But Alan's in a total panic. He knows what happens in this room and he just can't get the doors open. And so he began banging on the door with his crowbar and screaming for anybody out in the factory floor to please stop this process that's surely starting inside of this room. Open these doors, get me out of here. But it was so loud out on the factory floor, nobody heard him. 
And so before long, Alan must have looked around and saw the walls inside of this tight, cramped space beginning to glow red. Because this molding room was actually just an oven. It reached almost 600 degrees Fahrenheit in about 10 minutes. And so Alan is watching what as this oven hell? is restarting and he's sealed inside of it. And so the walls turn bright red and then before long the crowbar he was using to try to open the door must have become so hot he couldn't have held it and then the ground as well would have been red hot and his shoes would have begun to melt so did he knock some on with the crowbar freaking 600 degrees in 10 minutes i didn't even think about the crowbar getting hot dog he held it and then the ground as well would Damn, have been red Alan. hot and his shoes would have begun to melt and then the air temperature inside would have gotten so unbelievably hot he couldn't have breathed and so screaming in pain and pounding on the door, leaving his skin on the door every time he hit it, Alan eventually just collapsed to the ground in unimaginable pain as he cooked alive. Finally, when Alan caught on fire and black smoke began coming off of his body and pouring out onto the factory floor, the factory realized there's a problem with this molding room, so they turned it off, they opened it up, and they discovered Alan. It would turn out, after Mark and Alan had chatted about Christmas in the break room and then parted and gone their own ways, Alan had gone down to the factory floor and inside of that molding room, and his future son-in-law, Mark, had gone up to the control room where he would have no visibility of the factory floor. All he had was this big switchboard full of lights and switches and gauges that controlled all of the molding rooms. And not long after he got up there and was looking at the control panel, he saw a blinking light come on. And it was for the molding room that Alan was working inside of. And that blinking light meant someone had fixed the circuit board, and so that molding room now had power. And so reflexively, Mark just turned it on. And when he did that, the molding room began its restart process, which included sealing its doors and turning on the oven. And inside of that molding room, Two days there before were no Christmas, safety huh? Sealing its doors and turning on the oven. And inside of that molding room, there were no safety escapes. In fact, there was really no safety precautions at all with regards to these ovens. And so as soon as Mark flipped- And they never do, man. Even though these machines will take someone out just like that. They feel like when someone is designing these damn powerhouses, it's like, all right, I'm gonna make this this way. I'm gonna have this operate this way. This will only function this way. This will only work this way if X, Y, Z go that way. I feel like everything is implemented there except a damn emergency exit or some type of siren to let someone know, hey, I'm inside this mug or I'm hurt from this mug. But nah, we got everything except that, man. I cannot imagine the pain or the guilt that Mark was feeling knowing what happened like i was just doing my job and i noticed it was working so of course i'm gonna do my job and go ahead and turn it back on i guess i should have checked now nah, i can't put any blame on him man he's doing his job but alan just happened to be in there this story is effed up though uh, Turning i think on i the went oven. back and too far inside of that molding room there were no safety escapes in fact there was really no safety precautions at all with regards to these ovens and so as soon as mark flipped that switch he had killed his future father-in-law Five years later, the Kayak Molding Rest Company peace, was convicted Alan. of corporate manslaughter and fined 200,000 pounds. Also, the man who actually designed these molding rooms with no safety precautions in mind, no emergency exits, nothing, he was fined 25,000 pounds and sentenced to jail for nine months. Oh, damn, they don't play over there. <laughs> I was just talking about that. Hey, they gave you jail time over there. Sheesh. I mean, I, I do agree the fines should have definitely been there. And we did announce that it was shut down, but I mean, hey, I don't know how ish operate here, dog. The exit's nothing. He was fined 25,000 pounds and sentenced to jail for nine months. Open your. Inconspicuous. On the evening of October 28th, 2006, in a Florida city called Port Ritchie, a 37-year-old woman named Marisa Weber walked in the front door of her home and called out a greeting to her mom. Her mom didn't call back, but Marisa could hear her in the kitchen making dinner, and so Marisa walked over to say hello. But Marisa only got about two feet into the family's very cramped living room when one of their many cats came bombing into the room and nearly knocked Marisa over as it ran past her and ran up to the side of the wall and just stopped and stared at the baseboard of the wall like there was something there. Marisa was totally annoyed by this cat, and as she looked over at it, she knew what it was doing. Because lately, Marisa had noticed there were clearly rats in her family home, kind of scurrying around in the ceilings and the walls. Marisa could hear them all the time, and one of their cats was now clearly hunting one of these rats. And this totally stressed Marisa out. 
she'd actually begun taking anti-anxiety and antidepressant medication, largely because of this rat infestation, and really just the fact that Marisa hated living at her parents' home, but she didn't really have the means to go out and live in her own place, which she knew would solve the problem, and so she was just kind of stuck here. And so Marisa turned away from the cat and likely the rat behind the wall, and she made her way through the tight little living room into the kitchen, and she gave her mom a quick hug, and she saw her dad was also in the room as well, and he said hello to her. And then Marisa's mom offered her some food, but Marisa said, you know what, I'm not hungry, thank you. I'm just tired, I'm gonna go to bed. Uh, and so Marisa here. again gave her mom a I'm not hungry, thank you. I'm just tired, I'm gonna go to bed. And so Marissa again gave her mom a hug, she said goodnight to her dad, and then she turned, walked up the stairs, and made her way to her bedroom. She went inside and shut the door. The next morning, Marisa's parents got up and they began making breakfast and getting ready for the day, but Marisa did not come downstairs, and so the parents assumed she must have left early for her job. Marisa was a secretary at a waste disposal company. And so the parents just had their breakfast and they too went out for their jobs. And then in the evening when the parents were back home, Marisa did not come home at the time she normally would after work. But the parents were not actually that concerned right then because they figured, okay, well maybe she left early and she came home from work early and so we just kind of missed her on both ends and that's why her door to her bedroom is shut. She's just come home early and she's in there and she wants to be left alone. After all, she's a 37 year old woman. She probably wants her space. But later that night, when still the parents had not even heard their daughter moving around up there, the mother went upstairs and knocked on Marisa's bedroom door. But there was no answer. And so finally, Marisa's mom opened the door and the room was totally empty. Now, at this point, the parents did start to get concerned because they're thinking, okay, well, we didn't see her this morning. We haven't seen her now. We don't know where she is. But again, their daughter is 37 years old. And if she wanted to go do something out of the house by herself and not tell anyone, she was kind of entitled to do that. And so the parents ultimately decided that they would just let this go for now. And in the morning, they were sure to see her. But the next morning, the parents still had not heard from Marisa, she had not come home, and now they were officially starting to panic. In particular, the mother was worried that Marisa might have been kidnapped or something going to or coming back from work because Marisa was only five foot- Yeah, wait, wait, real quick, because I'm tripping as well. This is top three places people can't go, meaning she's going to be somewhere she shouldn't be anyway, but I'm not going to lie to you. The way the story is going, yeah, 37, living at home, my parents, I ain't got no money to live on my own. Yeah, that can definitely make someone feel like they're failure in life and now we got rats are we talking about mice or rats i mean not like y'all know whatever but regardless though i was thinking a third party got involved maybe she got to messing with someone trying to get some extra money i don't know but i don't think that'll be the case with this topic now they were officially starting to panic in particular the mother was worried that marisa might have been kidnapped or something going to or coming back from work because marisa was only five foot three inches tall and maybe a hundred pounds so she was really small and so Marisa's mom hey, called her other daughter, Gina, in a total panic, saying, you know, your sister, she's missing. We don't know where she is. She might've gotten kidnapped. You know, come over and help us figure out what's going on. And so Gina came over to the house. And when she came inside, she told her parents, you know, let's stay calm here. Marisa, she's 37. I'm sure she's fine. Let's search the house and see if there's some note or something from Marisa explaining where she is and what she's doing. And so the family searched the whole house, starting with Marisa's room, but they couldn't find anything that gave them any clues about what happened to Marisa. But they did eventually find Marisa's purse that was still in her room, and when they opened it up, they saw her wallet was still inside. And so that sent up a huge red flag for the family. You know, they're thinking, why would Marisa go anywhere for an extended period of time without what her wallet? Hell? That made no sense. And so at this point, the family did call the police and they reported Marisa missing. But the police got nowhere on the case. And so on November 9th, so 12 days after Marisa had said goodnight to her parents, gone up to her room and then vanished, the family was at a total loss for what to do. But Gina, Marisa's sister, had begun to think to herself, you know, hey, it's possible that Marisa, who was not doing well mentally, you know, she was very unhappy, she was totally stressed out about this rat infestation, which really highlighted the fact that she was stuck at home with her parents at 37 I'm telling years you, old. Dog. You know, Gina's thinking that it was totally possible that Marisa had just abruptly run away, or worse, maybe she had harmed herself. And so on November 9th, 
Gina decided she would take one more pass through the family home and just see if she could find any little indication that would give away what was going through Marisa's mind before she vanished. And where Gina started was in Marisa's room. And so Gina Crack this, she went upstairs Crack this she shit. vanished. And where Gina started was <coughs> in Marisa's room. And so Gina, she went upstairs, down the hall, she opened up her sister's bedroom, and she walked inside, and you gotta picture this space. It was totally cluttered, almost like a hoarder's space. There were piles of clothes that were taller than a human person. I mean, this room is totally packed with stuff. But Gina, she took her time kind of walking through the room. I mean, that is definitely kind of contributing to getting the damn rat's dog. Oh, space. There were piles of clothes that were taller than a human person. I mean, this room is totally packed with stuff. But Gina, she took her time kind of walking through the room, looking everywhere, kind of sifting through all the piles of junk and clothes and everything in the room, and she couldn't find anything. But then at some point, her attention was drawn to her sister's bookshelf, and she looked over at it, and she thought she saw something odd right in the middle of the shelf. Now, Gina had a flashlight with her, and even though the light was on in the room, she still lifted up the flashlight and turned it on and shined it at this thing in the middle of the bookcase. And when she saw it, she screamed. Based on Gina's discovery, here is what happened to Marisa Weber on October 28th, 2006, the night she disappeared. This one got me thinking so much different ish, dude. And I'm confused on the whole rat situation because it from at least from what it looks like, I, and I'm just judging the book by its cover, but the pictures I see of the community look freaking nice, dog. At least versus what I see in Flint, She dude. still lifted up the flashlight and turned it on and shined it at this thing in the middle of the bookcase. And when she saw it, she screamed. Based on Gina's discovery, here is what happened to Marisa Weber on October 28th, 2006, the night she disappeared. That night, Marisa had come home. She saw her mom and dad in the kitchen. She was offered food. She turned it down and said, I'm tired, I'm going to bed. She went upstairs, she went into her room, closed the door and sat down on her bed. Then Marisa grabbed a pill bottle next to her bed, which contained morphine and codeine, which are two very powerful painkillers. They're opiates, so highly addictive. She popped a few of those and then she rolled a marijuana joint and smoked that. And then she grabbed the TV remote and sat back on her bed, getting ready to zone out. But when she tried to turn on the TV, which was sitting on this bureau on the other side of the room, it didn't turn on. And right away, Marissa knew that the TV likely had become unplugged. This was something that happened periodically. The room was so packed with stuff that sometimes when Marissa was just navigating through her room, the stuff would bump into the bureau and that would in turn jostle loose the plug from the TV. But the TV was actually not plugged in right behind where this bureau was. The TV was sitting on the bureau, but the plug ran down and kind of to the side of the bureau behind this huge bookcase that was pressed right up against the bureau. But this bookcase was so loaded down with books and things that Marissa had collected over the years that not only could you not really reach through the bookcase to the wall, but it was too heavy, you couldn't move the bookcase. And so the only way to access this plug from the TV was to climb on top of the bureau where the TV was and kind of reach back and grab the plug behind the bookcase and plug it back in. And so Marissa, who was likely beginning to feel the effects of all the drugs she had taken, climbed on top of this bureau and she reached back behind the six foot tall bookcase and she began trying to grab the plug, but it was just out of reach. And so she leaned farther and farther and farther until she finally you grabbed the plug. Buster. But when she managed to plug it back into the wall, she slipped forward and fell head first into this tiny space behind the bookshelf and the wall. And she got pinned upside down. Now we don't know why Marisa didn't begin calling out for help. Perhaps she was so under the influence of these drugs that she couldn't really process the situation and didn't know what she should do. Or maybe she was embarrassed about the fact that she... Yeah, but I was definitely leaning more towards the embarrassed side. Not gonna lie to you, doggy bone. 37 up here living with my parents. I, I got a job doing what I'm supposed to do besides being filthy. Other than that, I'm just up here doing drugs on top of everything. So yeah, it would be embarrassing. And fell head first into this tiny space behind the bookshelf and the wall. And she got pinned upside down. Now, we don't know why Marisa didn't begin calling out for help. Perhaps she was so under the influence of these drugs that she couldn't really process the situation and didn't know what she should do. Or maybe she was pinned upside down. Now, we don't know why Marisa didn't begin calling out for help. 
Perhaps she was so under the influence of these drugs that she couldn't really process the situation and didn't know what she should do. Or maybe she was embarrassed about the fact that she had somehow gotten trapped upside down behind her bookcase. But either way, she didn't call out for help right away. And unfortunately, what happens when a human body is trapped upside down long enough is all the blood rushes to the upper part of your body. It causes your eyes eventually to pop out of your head. It feels like your head's gonna explode. But the real problem is all that blood pools around your lungs and restricts your lungs and makes it really hard to breathe. And critically, if you can't take a big breath in, you can't project your voice loud enough to call out for help. And so Marisa did not call out for help during those first critical few moments she was trapped behind the bookcase. And then when she realized she absolutely hey, couldn't move, she didn't have the lung capacity to call out for help. And so likely for one or maybe even two days, Marisa remained upside down behind this bookshelf and likely was aware of her family coming in and out of her bedroom looking for her but she was not able to vocalize. She could not get their attention. And so eventually she died. Marisa's family would say when they were looking for Marisa in her bedroom while she was dying behind the bookcase, they said they did hear sounds, but it sounded like the rats that were running all over their house. And so they didn't know it was actually likely Marisa moving around behind the bookcase, trying to get their attention because you can't mm, use- Understandable, understandable. It is, man, it is. It's just, I- was actually likely Marisa moving around behind the bookcase trying to get their attention because you can't use her voice. And then after Marisa died, her family did continue to go back into her room to look for her and they began to smell something funny, which was Marisa decomposing, but the family didn't know that and they chalked it up to the fact that the room was really messy. No and ass. again, there are rats in this house. I mean, this was not a clean space. And so they kind of thought, okay, you know, the smell can't be anything serious. It wasn't until November 9th when Marisa's sister, Gina, was back in Marisa's bedroom and she looked over at the bookcase and she saw something strange. What she saw was her sister's foot right behind the bookcase. Gina couldn't really process it so she got her flashlight out, she shined it on the foot and when she scanned from the foot down she realized it was her sister. Now, which makes sense why all her personal belongings were still found inside the home because if the story was playing out, I ain't gonna lie to you, the beginning I was upset. I was like, no, there's a third party involved here. Something fishy is going on. But then when Mr. Baller started describing the room, how the family had to maneuver through it, legit like they were swimming through trash and clothes and cluttering-ish, I really started picturing the show Hoarders, for real. And I was like, yo, it is not too hard to believe that someone really can get lost in this shit. It legit be filth everywhere. And of course, with them having the rats kind of covering everything as well, man, you probably would put it past on some ish, but... Regardless, man, definitely rest in peace, Marissa. And her being so little and high. Yeah, rest in peace, rest in peace. Ear warm. On the night of May 29th, 2007, a 29 year old man named Romy Baligula sang to himself as he and a big group of his friends wandered into a karaoke bar in the city of San Mateo in the Philippines. Life had not been easy lately for Romy. But tonight, he was feeling good. He and his buddies had begun drinking alcohol about an hour earlier, and so he already had a nice buzz as he walked into this bar. He had a brand new shirt on, and for the first time in weeks, Romy actually had money in his pocket. <laughs> Romy had lost his job a couple of months earlier, and since then, he had not been able to find new employment. And so this city he was living in, San Mateo, even though it was one of the wealthiest places in all of the Philippines, it was also known as a place that had lots of poverty and really no safety net for people that fall on hard times. And so if you lose your job, like Romy had, you could find yourself out on the streets really quickly looking for scrap metal to sell and dumpster diving just to find your next meal. And that's exactly what Romy had been doing Damn. for the better part of the last two months. He had been living out on the streets. But just a day earlier, he had discovered this stash of very valuable scrap metal, and he had sold it that day for a nice profit. And with that money, he had bought a nice big dinner, a brand new shirt, and tonight he had bought a night out. And the best kind of night out for Romy was going to a karaoke bar because Romy loved to sing, and his friends did too, but 
Romy sang basically all the time. Whether he was full-time employed, making lots of money, enjoying life, or if he was in a dumpster looking for food to eat, Romy would be singing. Now, That's Romy was not I the do. best singer, certainly not compared to some of his friends who were excellent singers. Which I get it. It does suck, though, because when you're down on your last, and man, you do gotta sacrifice the, the fun you like having, but hey, that's some people motto. I'm gonna do what I love doing, though, regardless. <laughs> and that freaking name, man, I can't stop seeing Martin when he said it, but let's go ahead and see what Rome at Rome up to, though. Let me go back a bit. Basically, all the time, whether he was full time employed, making lots of money, enjoying life, or if he was in a dumpster looking for food to eat, Romy would be singing. Now, Romy was not the best singer, certainly not compared to some of his friends who were excellent singers. But he felt like the more he sang, the better he got. And he was kind of proud that he felt like he was progressing and becoming a better and better singer. And Romy's favorite songs to sing were these big ballads. He just loved to close his eyes and let the words of the story kind of take him away. It really was his escape. It was like no matter how bad his life got, he could always sing and that would make him feel better. Once Romy and his friends went inside the karaoke bar, they made their way across the very crowded space to the far side of the bar. They found two unoccupied tables, they pushed them together, they all sat down, and then they ordered a round of beers. And then after the beers came, the friends all did a toast to their wonderful night out they were having. And then, one by one, each of Romy's friends began getting up and making their way over to the karaoke machine and began going through all the music and deciding which songs they were going to sing that night. One of Romy's friends chose an American country song. Another one of his friends chose a pop song from the 1980s about unrequited love. But regardless of the songs that any of Romy's friends chose, when they began getting up there and singing their song, it was like the karaoke bar came alive. People in the Philippines love karaoke. It's really a part of the culture. In fact, many people in the Philippines have a karaoke machine of their own in their house. And so what that means oh, really is that. in karaoke bars like the one Romy was at, the crowd is both really appreciative of good singers who go up there and do karaoke really well and everyone will get up and cheer and dance along. And then also if there are bad karaoke singers, the crowd is just as quick to begin jeering and booing at them and getting them to stop. And Romy knew that when he went up on stage that night, he was taking a bit of a risk because when he went up and identified the song that he was going to sing, he knew it was a questionable choice, but he was confident in his abilities. He had been singing and practicing. He really felt like he was ready to nail this really challenging song and the crowd was going to love him for it. As Romy sat at the table watching one of his friends perform a fast paced song about a race car, the bar's bouncer, a 43-year-old man named Robolito Ortega, came over to Romy's table with a big grin on his face. Robolito didn't recognize Romy or his friends, they were new at this bar, and so Robolito wanted to introduce himself and get to know these people, one, because Robolito was a big karaoke enthusiast, just like everybody else was, and two, Robolito felt like it was easier to keep the peace in this bar when everybody knew him and he knew everybody. And so Romy and his yeah, friends, they chatted happily with Robolito. And then after Romy's friend, who was singing the song about the race car, wrapped up and came down off the stage, Robolito gave him a nice congratulatory pat on the back and told the friend he did a great job up there. And the friend, in turn, turned around and flagged down the bartender at the other side of the bar and kind of gestured, hey, we want another round of drinks. And the friend also made it clear that he wanted to give a drink to the bouncer as well as like a thank you to the bouncer for giving him the compliment. And the bouncer said, thank you very much. And then before long, the beers arrived and Romy and his friends and the bouncer, they all cheers and toasted the night and enjoyed their drinks together. And then just a couple of minutes later, it was Romy's turn to take the stage. And so he got up and as confidently as he could kind of jogged up onto the stage and he took the microphone and he looked out at the crowd and everybody's having a great time. It seemed like the mood was really positive and Romy really felt like, again, even though this song was a questionable song choice, that this crowd was going to love it and that he was gonna do a wonderful job. But when the song began to play in the background, Romy noticed that right away, the mood in the bar completely shifted. It went from loud, happy, and talkative to almost silent as everybody in the bar turned and looked up at the person who had chosen this song. But Romy had anticipated this and he knew as soon as he actually began singing this song that he could win them over. He was gonna nail this song. 
And sure enough, Romy began to sing, and right away, it was like the mood began to kind of return to what it was. People in the audience could tell that Romy was doing a good job, and so about a third of the way into his song, Romy noticed that the bar was basically back to normal. He even looked over and saw the bouncer, who was still standing with his friends over at the table, had raised his beer, kind of saying, keep it up, you're doing great. And when Romy saw the bouncer really getting into it, Romy had the surge of adrenaline, and suddenly he felt so confident that he really leaned into the song and so he began dancing on stage and really belting out each of the lines of the song but at some point in the song there's this moment where the singer really needs to hit a high note and when Romy very confidently attempted to hit this high note his voice cracked and it was a really loud like obvious cracking of his voice and it kind of threw Romy off rhythm and he couldn't really get back on rhythm and so right away the audience reacted by going quiet again and looking angrily up at Romy like we knew you were going to screw this up this was a bad choice and Romy actually looked over and saw the bouncer and now the bouncer had his beard down and he's glaring angrily at Romy like what are you doing but Romy even though he was kind of faltering here he did his best to kind of regain his composure because because he knew he had practiced this song so many times, he knew he could do it, and he tried so hard to get back on we track. We don't um boo here in the U.S. at karaoke, right? I've been on here a couple times, but I know I bombed them all. But normally we like ha ha laugh it off this person just suck type situation, right? Knew he could do it, and he tried so hard to get back on track, but he just couldn't do it. And it was around this point that he looked back at Robolito, the bouncer, and all he would have seen is Robolito angrily belting out the words of this song, almost like he was trying to override how badly Romy was singing it. And then at some point, as Romy is staring at Robolito, Robolito, while singing this song, pulls out a gun, no aims it at Romy, way. and fires. In the Philippines, there is one song that everybody knows you do not sing. In fact, this song is often banned in most karaoke bars, and then even when it's not banned, nobody sings it. And the reason this song is so forbidden is because since 1998, people have begun being murdered for singing it. Reasons unknown, but it just keeps on happening. Since 1998, 12 people have been murdered either while they were singing this song for karaoke or immediately after it. The forbidden song is called My Way by Frank Sinatra, and that was the song that Romy chose. Now, no one really understands why this song somehow elicits all this violence in people in karaoke bars in the Philippines, but it does. Some have said that the message of the song, which is about a man being a man and doing it his way, kind of brings out a lot of masculine energy amongst people that are listening to it, and it can apparently prompt people to just suddenly start acting violent. But that's just a theory. No one really understands why this song just keeps leading to murders. But on May 29th, 2007, when Romy sang this song, Robolito the bouncer, who liked Romy and liked his friends and was having a nice drink with them, right? he just couldn't handle it when the song was getting butchered and he hated the song to begin with. And in fact, ironically, Robolito had been hired by that karaoke bar specifically to keep the peace if the song were to come on. But as he listened to the song, something happened inside of him and he pulled his gun and shot and killed Romy. So that's, that's going to do it. If you got end. something out of today's stories, be sure to check out our podcast called the Mr. Ballin Podcast. Mm. Whoa, not even going to the song itself first. The fact that I had no idea karaoke was that level there. Hey, I mean, that's dope. That's their culture. That's what they do. I like it. Dog. But the song, I've never in my life heard. I have heard the name Frank Sinatra before. I always heard good about the name, though. But man, you tell me, so the song come on and it sounds like Robolito, Robolito, if I'm saying that right, my bad. He had to either decide, yo, because we hear what this song does. It brings out the masculinity, which real masculinity is not violent. All right. But either way it go, though, it's going to bring it out. And then people are just going to go in this uproar and get to attacking. And hey, then someone has to die when this mode, ha when this mode happens. So it's either take out you, which is the one, or what I was hired for versus what I take it to be hundreds, which would be the audience that you are pissing off. And he had to make a decision. But, like, what happened? Did he, was he off the case? Everything was cool? Uh, the audience, did they get dog off the floor, keep on going? I don't know. That is, yo, that is wild. 
Damn. But it sounds like his life went to shit and he was like, F it, man. I'm going to take the risk of trying to win over this audience to prove it to them. Show them, yo, I'm the best at this. Solidify my spot. I got this. Or go out doing what I love because, hey, it sounded like he was just blowing through the money anyway. Like, yep, it's either this or that. But I don't know, though. That's just what I speculate. Hey, I'm about to go ahead and get up out of here. Hey, go ahead and enjoy your day. Enjoy your morning, your evening, your night. Whenever you're watching this video, but I'm out.